And to, if you have a tech talk you would like to do, I, I was just talking to Jamie, and she might do one that's fascinating with medical devices. Uh, just talk to me afterwards, because we're always looking for something new. It's a chance to share, to learn, to get, learn, see stuff that's going on uh, in the world that you may not see otherwise. So this one came a talk came about from the idea of uh, I get dropped in the mailbox for ETA or people come by and say they want to teach classes. And so the first thing I do is look at their website to see what they do. And nine times out of 10, their website, and these are tech people, their website says under construction or a note from your web hosting company, you are ready to go put your website up there. And these are tech people. So I thought, let's do a little more techie talk. This is not setting up WordPress. This is about setting it up on Amazon Web Services where you pay by traffic and it's really low cost. So it's, it's tailor-made for somebody's personal website for hobby or their portfolio. And because we have one hour, we're not going to dwell on the HTML parts, the CSS, the design. We're not going to get into React or Angular or make it interactive. It's going to be a website kind of like this, totally like this. And we're going to build another one that's Randy will have a little bit simpler. And if you have questions about the dev, HTML, CSS afterwards, it, as time's remaining, or I can, we'll stick around, we can ask, we can bring that up. So this is Randy, he's a certified solutions architect for Amazon Web Services. So our focus is Amazon Web Services. There's other ways to go about cloud. So what Amazon Web Services has, has done is they've created basically a giant Lego box of services. And what we're going to do is use a few of these pieces to put together our website. There's going to be a lot of screens. I've got something like 80 slides. It's not terribly complicated, uh, but we're going to move fairly fast through it. And we'll show each page and how to set up. And there's a few gotchas along the way. This really is not complicated. If you've got your basic HTML page ready to go, your basic website ready to go, you can be up and running within an hour on AWS. Uh, if you run into problems, it may take two hours. But um, for the most part, it, it's, don't get overwhelmed by the number of slides we're gonna show, because it's, it's actually fairly straightforward once you get in there and do this. So what we're gonna be using is S3, which is a, a, a place to store our static web pages, CloudFront, which is gonna distribute our content, Route 53, which is the DNS service, and then we'll be using Certificate Manager for our SSL certificates. So hosting a static website, um, a dynamic website, it relies on a server running. It's gonna run something like PHP or ASP or something like that, and it's going to execute code and it's going to kick out an HTML file that the browser will then render and show. A static website is just the HTML file. Uh, however, what happens is that within that HTML file, and even with dynamic websites, there's a lot of JavaScript in them. And the JavaScript will execute on the browser, on the user's computer, and from there, you can get to a whole bunch of services. You can take credit cards, you can, uh, I, I belong to a, a site for training, for AWS training, and there's a huge video site. They have tons of videos and classes, they take credit cards, they have membership, their whole thing is serverless. They run off static web pages, even though it's a highly dynamic, interactive site. So we're gonna start with S3, which is the simple storage service. It is object-based, so think of things like documents, files. Uh, this is not executable code. This is more uh, data. Um, if you know what Dropbox is, Dropbox is, was originally based on S3, and so S3 is just Dropbox behind the UI. Um, there's unlimited storage. Files can be zero to five terabytes. Um, we're gonna talk about buckets. They're just the folders or directories that you're storing in. 99.99% um, .99 availability and 11 nines durability. They replicate it all over the place. Uh, you put it up there, it's not going away. So you'll need an AWS account to do this. Um, I'm not gonna go through how to sign up for AWS. Uh, and you can walk through it. When you go to aws.amazon.com, select that you want to start a new account. They'll walk you through. You're going to have to give them a credit card because they're going to have charges against you. But your first year is going to be on the free tier, 
and almost everything you do will be free. Um, and you can actually do a lot free. There's huge amounts of resources they give you. There's a few things like Route 53. Obviously, you're going to have to pay for a domain name if you buy it. And there's a few other things that you would have to pay for, but most things are on the free tier. You'll notice that there's just this huge list of all these services, and they're constantly adding them every day. So you're going to want to go up to the search bar and type in what you're looking for. You can scroll down through and check everything out, but the easiest way to find what you want is just type it up there. And what we type up in there now is S3, and that will bring us to our S3 screen. You know, you may not have any buckets. I have a bunch of buckets. And we're going to want to create a bucket. So hit that button there. Now the key thing to remember is that when you create a bucket for a website, the bucket name has to match your website exactly. So in this case, we're going to create a website called smartbizmojo.com. And you need to put the .com in there. Um, the other thing on this is S3 is a global namespace. So if anybody else has created a bucket anywhere in the world called smartbizmojo.com, you will not be able to create that bucket. Now, I've never ran into that yet, but if you do things like create a bucket named Workspace or Test, you're not going to get that. That's not going to happen. Um, so create the name exactly like your URL. Don't worry about the properties. Keep all the defaults. Here, we're going to have to grant public ac read access. The default is do not grant public read access because this is your storage space. This is your hard drive. But we're going to grant public access because it's a website, and we want people to have public access. And you get this nice little warning that everybody in the world will have ac read access to this bucket, but that's what we want. So review, everything's fine, and we create the bucket. So now we've got our bucket down here. It's marked as public. I put everything in US West Oregon. I don't know why. You don't have to. It doesn't matter. There's all these regions all over the world. I have this need to be close to where my stuff is. But um, there is one case when we do the SSLs that you'll need to make sure you do it in the uh, Northern Virginia region. But that's the only one. I'll, go, I'll mention that when the time comes. So we select. You just double click on the smartbizmojo.com bucket. We're going to go to Properties. We're going to go to Static Website Hosting. Now we're going to click the bucket that says the button that says use this bucket to host a website. Now we also need to put the index document in there. This is going to be what our default home page is. It could be homepage.html, could be whatever you want. We're going to use index.html. Save it. Now select Upload. There is a bunch of different ways you can upload files to S3. There's a, there's a command line interface that once you get your credentials set up right, you can run standard Linux calls like copy or list or anything like that on your buckets. There's a number of SDKs, so you can write Python scripts to do it. I've got a Python script that'll pull things out of a zip file and put them into a bucket. But you also can just drag and drop. And for this little website, we're just going to drag and drop some files over. Yep, we want to check everything, make sure we're getting the files we want. We have to grant public read access to the files. So we've granted it to the bucket. We also have to grant it to the files. Otherwise, you're going to get a 403 error. Again, you get your nice little warning. Um, storage class, we take standard. There, these, the standard IA is infrequently accessed. There's also reduced redundancy. These are much lower cost storage. The vast majority of S3 is file storage. It's not websites. Uh, those are not suitable for a website. But if you're storing files and you don't access them very often, maybe once a year or occasionally, you would do something like standard IA and it'll be a much cheaper, about half as much half as much to store, but you pay every time you access the file. None of that stuff we care about for our website, so we keep the standards. Review and upload, and now our website is there. OK, so we select Properties again. Go to Static Website Hosting. Now you'll see this endpoint. That is a URL. You click it, and we're live. So that's it. Our website's up there. Now, the URL is this weird S3 URL. In the past, when it, the first thing you had to do before you could even build a website is get a domain name. 
But with S3, they'll give you a domain name. It's not a particularly pretty domain name. You're not going to want to market around it. But it will work if you're trying to demo stuff or if you just want to do something with them among friends. Go ahead. If you already have a, a, a domain, uh, can, it, can you just enter it at that point? Yes. Do you know what the difference between a good question is and a great question is in a presentation? Probably the ones I ask. The great question is the one where the next slide answers that question. Okay, I'm sorry. So the next slide, we're going to actually go through and set up smartbizmojo.com. Um, but it, this is actually kind of neat, and I've used this. And you can actually pass this around in emails and stuff if you're trying to demo stuff. And you're done. At this point, you're, you're running your website. But we want to have Smart Biz Mojo. So what we're going to look at is Route 53, which is the Amazon's DNS service. You can purchase and you manage your domain names. Uh, if you purchase your domain name through Amazon, you automatically get configured for DNS as you move through this. Otherwise, you got to do it by hand. It's not a big deal. Uh, we actually, Smart Biz Mojo is actually on GoDaddy because that's where we bought it. And so we'll go through and show how to configure it if you have your domain at GoDaddy and you want to use it on this. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do with DNS service. Um, once you, if you get set up and you're actually spinning up your own data uh, services, you're not using S3, which S3 is managed by Amazon. But you can also create your own virtual networks with web servers and stuff. And if you do that and you have them strung out around the world in different regions, you can start to route traffic based on geography or latency or all kinds of things. So um, it's a very powerful service. We're using it for the most bare bones reason, which is just directing our domain names. Whoops. So we go back, we enter Route 53. This is what it's going to look at. Uh, you can register a domain. You can do your DNS management. We're going to, this is the, go to the dashboard. And you can see register domain up in the corner. There's also the list of things to do on the side. I'm going to, when you choose a domain to register, if you choose to do that, you can see the prices are going to be based upon what the top level domain is, .net, .org, .com. There's just a ton of them in there. Some of them will cost you $200 a pop. Uh, quite a few of them are below the price of .com. These prices are Amazon's prices. They're competitive. The, you can always get a better deal somewhere else because other people, like GoDaddy, if you Google for certificates for GoDaddy, there's usually a way to get it for the first year free and all these. Amazon doesn't do that. They're not in the business, really, of trying to compete at that level. But uh, the $12, if you have a ton of domains, you probably want to do it somewhere else. But if you only have one or two, I'm not sure the extra 25 cents a month compared between $8 a year and $12 a year is worth messing with, especially because it's automatic. .com uh, is $15 a month. Am I reading that right? Yeah. But no, it's .com.au. It's $15 a month. .co.uk is 9 What would be a com? .com? is right at the top, $12. What we're going to do is we're going to host a zone. So we're going to select hosted zones. We're going to say create a hosted zone. It's going to come up like this. It's good. This window will fill in. And we're going to enter in smartbizmojo.com. And now that's, we've created our, our basic hosted zone. Those name servers up there that I've highlighted, that is what you will have to enter into your domain uh, registrar. So for us, it was at GoDaddy. We go to GoDaddy, we enter those name servers into the name server location, and that's how your registrar will know where your website is living. It knows now that we're in Route 53. So, go ahead. So to clarify, that initial uh, subdomain that we were assigned, is that a static IP or is that a domain? There's no IPs. Well, there is, but you don't get to see it, basically. Because, because with S3, it's, it's this huge RAID-like device that's out there. And there's not like one physical location you're looking at. No. And I, that's a good question. I haven't actually looked at how in detail at doing that. Often in AWS, the standard answer is no. But there's often workarounds. 
Uh, but to do that, what you can get, you can get a, an IP if you do a VPC, which is virtual private cloud, or you spin up an EC2 instance. At that point, you're spinning up a very specific virtual server that has specific capacity issues, and you have to manage the server. You have to patch it. So it's just like running a, a, a server in any cloud situation. So for this, we'll move, that's the, the name servers that we'll need to enter into GoDaddy or wherever we have our domain. So now we want to create a record set. This is our specific record set for our smartbizmojo.com. We'll select, I, I didn't put anything, if you can read here, it's kind of hard to see, it says smartbizmojo.com. It's asking what is going to be in front of it, like could it be sales or uh, you know, info.smartbizmojo.com. I left it blank. We're just talking about the basic undecorated URL, smartbizmojo.com. You select alias as the type for the button. It is yes, and then when you put your uh, cursor in this box for the alias target, you'll see a list of the targets that are eligible. And right here is our bucket that we created. So that's pre-populated by AWS. So you just select it. Create the, the, the record here. This will take a little bit of time to propagate, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. Technically it's a day or something, but it never takes that long. Rarely takes more than 30 minutes. There we go. We're smartbizmojo.com now. Once it is propagated, what about the W? www.smartbizmojo.com. So anything, you have smartbizmojo.com, and then you have what they call subdomains, which would be like sales or info or whatever it is. Dot. They're all considered separate websites. If, you go, if anybody's ever done anything with Google Analytics, you know this, it frustrates you because you want to get all your traffic for both www.smartbizmojo and smartbizmojo, but Google treats them as two separate websites. And we get treated here as two separate websites. So the www didn't work. How are we going to fix that? We're going to go back, we're going to create a bucket. That bucket is going to be www.smartbizmojo.com. We do not have to grant public read access to it because we're going to use it as a redirect bucket. There will be no files stored here. So there's nothing for anybody to see. So there it is. We double click on it. We go to properties, static website hosting. And this time we select redirect requests. So the above one is that you want to host a website out of it. We're not hosting a website out of it. We're redirecting anybody who hits this website to go to our other bucket, which we enter in as just the name of it, smartbizmojo.com. Now we want to go back and configure an A record, an alias record for this so that www can be found from the internet. So we go back to Route 53, we select the DNS management, the hosted zones. We select the hosted zone that we just created. We're going to create a new record set. And again, when we set, click the alias target, this time notice it says www at the front. When we select the alias target, it'll, in the drop down, it'll show up the new www bucket that we just created. Because in S3, your buckets have to match your domain name exactly or it's not going to show up in this list. And the, the S3 looks like it's a real thing, like it's a, like it's a piece of equipment setting out there, but it's not. It's a virtualized uh, disk drive where we've all got all these shards of data spread out all over the place. So um, it's annoying that you can't just redirect, like you could if you had a server, right? If you had just your regular server, you could put www to point to the same place you put the regular record. But in this case, we actually do need a bucket name. There'll be nothing in it. You'll never get charged for it because it's free to have a bucket. It's only get charged for what's stored in the bucket. And we've set it up like this. It'll take time. We got our new record now. It'll take time to propagate. And there we go. We're done, right? Kind of, sort of, because the connection is not secure. Do you care if the connection is secure? It depends. 
If you're going to take credit cards, it has to be a secure connection. A secure connection is HTTPS, HTTP secure. It means that the data being going in and out of the website is encrypted. So if anybody was to scope your traffic and see what you were passing back and forth through your website, they couldn't see anything. Um, and that's required for credit cards so that the credit card numbers aren't ever in the clear. But if you're not gonna take credit cards, do you care? The problem is Google has now prioritized secure websites over unsecure websites for search results. So you're not gonna show up in search results very well even if you have very good hits on your key terms, if you're not an SSL site, if you don't have HTTPS. Does that matter? Kind of depends on what you're doing. You'll have to make this choice. The good news is getting an SSL certificate used to be expensive and a little bit of a pain, but Amazon does it for free. So we'll be going to Certificate Manager to get an SSL certificate, and it will cost us nothing. You're going to, uh, the private security authority is a different thing. That is not free. That's like $400 a month, which means it must be really expensive in the real world because everything Amazon does is always much cheaper than, um, but we're not going to be worried about it. We're going to get public certificates. We're going to be clicking the provision certificates. All right, and it's a pretty simple. Can you go back and layer D and add these, this feature if you have to? If you oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. You, um, you'll have to do, I'm gonna show an extra step you have to do to make an SSL work with an S3 bucket. You can be done at this point if you don't want an SSL, and then you can come back at any time and add it. So, what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, request a public certificate. When you enter the domain names, make sure you enter both the www version and the Smart Biz Mojo the undecorated one. Always do this on your basic roots SSLs anytime you get them. You're supposed to, anything that's a subdomain, and www is technically a subdomain, you normally do it as star.smartbizmojo.com, but they've made special uh, rules on these SSL certificates for www's because everybody wants both the www and the regular one. So make sure you get both. Um, you can, if you have purchased your domain name with Amazon, you can do the DNS validation and it's much quicker. But since we did not do ours that way, since ours is at GoDaddy, we'll do an email validation. This is gonna send a, an email to the officially registered person according to the domain register who is the owner of the domain. They're gonna be given a link that they need to click to confirm that this is okay, that I'm not just trying to get an SSL certificate for uh, google.com that I actually do own this domain um, and so you if that's not you you need to be in communication with the person is if you work in a company and that's usually not the developer doing the work then they need to let them know because it will sit there until you get that email validated final step yep confirm and request now the request is in process you hit continue from here, it's telling you you're gonna get one email for each domain you've listed. So it'll be two emails that'll be coming in. So validation is not complete because the person hasn't clicked the button. Ah, now we're in, we've got our SSL certificate. This is very, very quick. I mean, it's almost instant when the person clicks the button. So as long, if you're set up right, uh, this will not take any time at all. So the key thing here is that the SSL certificate is to encrypt traffic that's on the public web coming into your private location. And you normally would assign it to like your Apache server if you're running your own server. Uh, if you're running a, a larger site with multiple web servers, you usually put the SSL certificate at the load balancer, the place where the public traffic comes in. But what do we do with an S3 bucket? We don't have control over that. That's Amazon's, that's their infrastructure. Um, so what we're gonna use to get that to work is CloudFront. CloudFront is Amazon's content delivery network. It takes requests for your website and it caches them locally. It caches them at the edge locations. There are 103 edge locations in 56 cities around the world. So what happens is the second time anybody at an edge location, that, through an edge location, hits your content, they will get your cached value. They will get, and it's much faster. 
Um, this is an enormous system. This is the system, they have the capability of caching huge files. They cache entire videos for Netflix in these root locations, these edge locations, and we're gonna use it for our little two-bit website. But it's available for you to use. Um, and we're gonna use just a tiny little piece just because, because of the edge locations are where the public information comes in, the CloudFront has to have the ability to have an SSL certificate just like a load balancer would. So we're going to assign our SSL certificates to our CloudFront distributions. So to create a CloudFront distribution, you go to the S3 console, you search for CloudFront, you come here and we're gonna create a distribution. So we want to do the web distribution. The other type you can do is RTMP, which is flash media. And we're not going to do that. <laughs> so I'm not sure, I don't know how many people do an RTMP distribution, but enough that they have it as an option. But we're going to be doing a web distribution. So your origin domain name. When you click it, notice all, the, all my buckets have shown up as an origin. And it's because this delivery network doesn't just serve web files. It'll serve any files. And in fact, it's used by uh, international companies when they have people like in Australia or Europe and they want their central S3, all their documents are stored in Oregon. They will use this content delivery system to speed up the back and forth traffic of moving documents back and forth. So you can make your origin for a distribution network any bucket you want. In our case, we are going to make it our Smart Biz Mojo bucket. Not the WW one, the Smart Biz Mojo. All right, you want to redirect all HTTP to HTTPS. So that means you'll only, anytime somebody types HTTP in your domain name, you'll automatically get sent out to be HTTPS. All right, so here is the default time to live. Time to live is how long your content's gonna set on the edge location. So once somebody hits your website, you're gonna cache your web page at the edge location. How do they know that that is still good? How do they know you haven't changed it at the origin? Well, they're gonna wait for the time to live. When the time to live expires, then they will go back and grab a fresh file. The time to live default is one day. So if you update your web page, it will not get updated at the edge locations for a full day. If you're in the middle of developing and you want to see how things go and you're changing, you probably want to change that default uh, to something like 60 seconds. Uh, but for performance reasons, the longer it is, the better, because what they'll do at 60 seconds is whenever somebody hits a site, they'll look at your page. If it's older than 60 seconds, they'll then send you all the way back to the origin. Um, so your performance is better the longer that time to live is. All right, you wanna enter for your C name, your alternate domain name, smartbizmojo.com. And then we wanna select custom SSL certificate. And then what'll appear in that drop down is the SSL certificate you created. So you just select that. And I always forget to do this. Make sure you put your default root name for your web page. If you don't do that because it really expects these S3 buckets to be file buckets, not web pages, what it's going to do is give you an XML spew of all the list of all the objects in your bucket. Because this is what the software that's working to interface file systems locally and with S3 needs. So by putting that in there, it will look for the index.html and that's what it will give you whenever you hit the default for the distribution. All right, it is now in progress. This takes a while. This is the longest thing of anything we've done. This will take the longest. This will take a good 30 minutes and sometimes longer. You're deploying to 103 edge locations all over the world. When we're done, that domain name right there is, the, is your distribution's domain name in, uh, for CloudFront and you can take that and paste it right into your browser and you'll get your web page. So do this as an intermediate step to make sure everything's configured right, that you don't get a bunch of XML here or something like that. Make sure you can see uh, your site. And notice there's a little green icon. We automatically switched over to HTTPS because we told it to redirect to HTTPS. So we obviously want to use our 
smartbizmojo.com. So how are we going to set that up is we're going to go back to Route 53. We're going to select hosted zones again. We're going to select our hosted zone. We're going to go to our smartbizmojo.com record. And we're going to change the alias tar uh, target to the CloudFront distribution. So instead of going to the S3 bucket, we're now going to the CloudFront distribution. Sometimes that won't be populated yet because it takes a while sometimes for the tools to catch up. So what we'll do is then you just can go ahead and just cut and paste this URL that you selected from uh, the web page. You can just cut and paste it in there. And then you'll get to your CloudFront. And now we've got smartbizmojo.com. Go into HTTPS. Anytime anybody enters it, you've got SSL secure. You can take credit cards. Uh, you're going to be found well by Google. However, www is not set up for this yet. And it's the same issue. We have an SSL certificate that will support the www. So what you want to do, there is the one got you here. Go to your S3 bucket for www. Copy your endpoint. Go back, we're going to create a new distribution, because you have to have a separate distribution for the www. In the origin domain name, do not select the thing out of the dropdown, but paste the URL you got in the other that we copied from the endpoint. I don't know why, but for redirect sites, this is what they want on CloudFront. This is the, and then you still want to do everything else the same, redirect HTTP to HTTPS, uh, when we do the alternate domain, make sure you enter www, custom SSL certificate, select the same SSL certificate. Default root object, leave it blank. There is no default root object at that bucket, so just leave it blank. You're going to hit it, you're going to be redirected to Smart Biz Mojo. There's our uh, CloudFront distribution once everything has been deployed. Copy that. We're going back over to our alias for our www record, and we're entering that CloudFront URL into the alias target. And now we're good. Now we've got www and SmartBizMojo, and everything redirects to SmartBizMojo. So even if you type in HTTP www, it's going to come out like this. Can any of those last steps be done with the command line? Yeah, probably. I haven't looked at deploying crowd, cloud front distributions from a command line. Almost everything started from Amazon's command line was the original tool. And I think you can do everything from the command line. And the advantage of using the command line would be that you would use scripts and files. And some people do that so that they can store. You end up with an artifact that you can put in GitHub or something like that so other people can do the same thing the next time you have to do it. But I've never actually done a, a cloud front distribution uh, from the command line. Ricky, what's the advantage of having it in CloudFront versus just setting the S3? What are the advantages of having it in CloudFront in your basic website? Well, if you're building it off S3 and you want an SSL certificate, it has to oh. use CloudFront. Um, but you're getting the distribution, the caching. And you're getting it, yeah. Stuff. Which I don't know how much traffic you're going to have from Australia, but depending on what you're doing, this will help that a lot. So uh, Amazon has a bandwidth-based charging model. Do we get charged for cash data, or just when we get the... I'll, well, I've got a cost breakout here in one of the slides, and we'll go through that. It's basically Amazon's pay-as-you-go, so they're going to they're gonna charge you for the amount of traffic that goes across CloudFront. Okay, regardless of what you prefer to give them cash or... Yes, yes it's going to be what comes out to the, the other person. Uh, between the route, the edge locations and the origin, you use Amazon's private network. Uh, they own their own fiber all over the world, and, and it is a faster than the public internet. And also, you don't have to worry about security issues. They encrypt everything from the edge location into the origin. So, we used S3 to store our static web pages. We used CloudFront to distribute and to contain our SSL certificate, and we used Route 53 to route our traffic. Those were the Lego blocks we used. But I can tell you from a, from a cost standpoint, from the two sites that I've run this way, it's less than 10 Now, they're not huge high traffic sites, but. 
But if it becomes popular, you should have your business model will compensate you properly. Yes. So here's an estimated cost. So S3 storage, the, it has a free tier. So again, the first time you join, you're going to get everything for free. Not quite everything. Route 53 is not free. But everything else on here is free, except for the domain name. And so um, S3, for the first year, you're not going to pay anything. Uh, after that, you're going to pay 2.3 cents per gigabyte per month. Now, this is a roughly two megabyte website, this little website we did. You can go to smartbizmojo.com and see it. It's a single page website with images and stuff, a really kind of basic uh, business card type website. Um, so I don't know, that's 24 megabytes for a year. They're gonna, I mean, you can do the math. It's some fractional pennies. And eventually, they'll accumulate, and they'll charge you a penny. But it will be a long time. So we don't have to worry about S3 storage. For the most part, you're not going to run into much cost there. CloudFront, it's 8.5 cents per gigabyte per month. So if we assume 1,000 users per month, and each one downloads the whole website per month, I know this is all kind of funny numbers, but you end up with 2 gigabytes per month, which is 17 cents for your CloudFront costs. All right, Route 53, that starts to get a little bit more pricey. It's 50 cents per hosted zone per month, period, flat cost. And then 40 cents per million queries. You're not gonna, per month. I'm, you're not gonna get a million queries. If you're getting a million queries, that's a big website. So I don't think you even have 1 40th of a million queries that you're gonna get. So say for a thousand user website, which is a nice small business website, a lot of the websites here for the, some of the small businesses on Winslow and stuff, they get between 500 and 1,500 unique visitors a, a month. So say 500, 1,000 users per month, so it's about 50 cents per month. Domain name's a dollar a month because it's $12 for a .com. The SSL is free, so the total comes to about a buck 67 a month, $20 a year. $12 of that $20 is your domain name. Of the $8 left that you're paying for infrastructure, six of that is for your Route 53. The $2 is CloudFront. So basically, CloudFront, for a, decent, for a nice little small website, is going to cost you $2 a year to run. For a thing that's going to scale at the level of Netflix, because Netflix uses this. Do you have a way of controlling the bandwidth? You have, there's a, 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 you can set up, there's a cloud, there's a monitoring mm -hmm. service and you can set up billing alerts. And once you cross a certain threshold, they'll send you an email and a text message and say, you know, you've spent. Just do it for $1,000. Can you? Yeah. Well, you can. Can you tell them not to get to that level of bandwidth? No, and this is one of the things. They're going to ramp up to handle the traffic. Now, the flip side, if you're on CloudFront, you should never experience a denial of service attack. Because what CloudFront will do is ramp up to meet the traffic. Denial of service attacks work by flooding you with so much traffic that you crash the servers. That's not going to happen with CloudFront. You get charged. That's the, thing. the bad news, the good news is you can never be knocked offline by denial of service. The bad news is you will be charged for it. So a lot of the denial of service attacks, though, are really small packets that are requesting a status. They don't actually flow much data, so it's probably not going to be much. Yes, if, if, if you can get big enough. It's going to take a lot because it's, you know, I mean, Eight and a half cents per gigabyte. That's you're going to have to flood me with a lot of requests to get. Probably just some more money. Yeah, and let, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm sure the Russians could knock us offline if they wanted to. But outside of that, I'm not sure. Questions? Yeah, and they, they um, and, it, and it varies from if you're like if you're if you're creating your own virtual cloud, if you're running your own virtual servers, the kind of standard thing you would do in a data cage, um, then you run these application load balancers, and they're tuned to handle a lot of this stuff. 
Um, but CloudFront's got all that on it, too. So you mentioned Unix-like command line. Is that yeah. you, bring up your, uh, you, you bring up the terminal, okay. and you say AWS space, and then like S3 dash copy CP and the file names. You'll have to set up an IAM, which is the Identity and Access Management Service. You'll need to set up your users, and when you set up yourself as a user, you can issue yourself credentials, keys. And you bring them down and you install them on your laptop and then you can do command line so calls. It's, like SSH. It's, the it's secure copy, yeah, it's SSH. And um, the other thing people will do is they will have, uh, EBS is the elastic block storage. So this is basically a virtual hard drive in the cloud and they will keep all of their files up there, all their development files. And they will, um, spin up an EC2 instance. All the Amazon Linux EC2 instances come with the command line pre-configured. And you grant it a, a policy that lets it do this stuff. And then you can just SSH into the EC2 instance and run all your command lines from there. And you connect to the EBS and you have all your files from the last time you were there. When you're done, you disconnect the EBS, you shut down the EC2 so you don't get charged for it, and move on. Uh, when you use a credit card service, um is all of the accounting done by uh, Amazon, or do they farm that out to a third party? Uh, you, it'll be done by your your credit card service company. Okay. So when you use Stripe, Stripe will run off of a JavaScript that you that you have in your browser, and you'll talk directly to Stripe, and you can go in, log into the Stripe account, and they'll list everything, who bought what, what you were charged, all that kind of stuff. You can also. Right, so Stripe is just, Stripe is uh, very similar to Square that all the stores are using. It's just a credit card processing. You can use any credit card on it. Uh, but Amazon Pay is for people within their Amazon account, which works for a lot of people. I thought Filament for the studio with Amazon Pay. Yeah. It was on the website, so it's so a lot of steps, a lot of back and forth. Obviously, if, if you know what you're doing straight up, you're gonna create both your WWW and your regular bucket at the same time. You're gonna do a lot of these steps at the same time. You're not gonna to have to go back and forth the way we did it here. Uh, but you can see, you can do this in an hour. So, so his static pages, are you gonna have dynamic uh, pages too? Well, the static pages have within them JavaScript, right? So the dynamic aspect of it is running on the browser. Now there's another service that Amazon has called API Gateway. And with API Gateway, what you create is a REST API based off of your URL. Uh, you configure that, and then that can evoke Lambda functions, which is their serverless compute service. So Lambda functions then can do anything. They can access almost any service on Amazon. They can hit DynamoDB, which is their NoSQL uh, Dynam, and that's how, like a cloud guru that runs these uh, training classes with all these videos and you gotta join and you pay and you have some classes you've paid for and some you haven't. They do it all hitting Lambda functions uh, from the browser, but it's all being directed from the browser. It's downloaded to the browser. There's nothing active on a server anywhere. The interaction comes from your browser, which is really the way they're going to more and more people with these microservices, because uh, they're basically using your computer. And if you may have heard stories of people uh, mining Bitcoin on people's websites, that's JavaScript they're downloading onto your computer. And if you've ever gone to some, I was searching for something on in, uh, like inflation data or something really benign and all of a sudden my CPU just spiked to 100% while I was sitting on the page and I got off the page and I'm pretty sure what they were doing were mining Bitcoins while I was looking at the data. They're using your CPU to mine the Bitcoins. You mentioned Python previously, but there it sounds like there's no server side scripting, it's all client side. It's all coming down to your browser. So it's JavaScript for the browser, but when you call back into Lambda through the API gateway, so it's a JavaScript call to invoke Lambda, that can be uh, Python, um, Java, um, I think. Um, Node.js, and there's a fourth one. I can't think of it right now. It's escaping me. 
Ruby, Ruby, yeah. And so those, and then you can write any of those functions. Based on what you said about the uh, availability of getting different things off of a uh, site, I'm assuming that there would be a service for uh, subscriptions. If you know you had a subscription type based business, uh, does that come under Amazon or is that again something that would be third party? Uh, both. So if you're talking about people would log into your site, um, there's they have what they call Cognito, which is their uh, service for managing users. Um, and I used in a, I used uh, in one uh, demo I did uh, zero auth, which is a service that's independent of Amazon. So but it's it zero a u t h, and it does everything. You 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 call their JavaScript feature, you set up an account, you call their JavaScript, they will force people, they'll, they'll manage all the password stuff that you have so, to have so many characters and have to have so many of these things. And once people log on, you they create a dashboard which will show you when everybody logged on and how long they were on and how many failed attempts there were and all that kind of stuff. And it's an independent service from Amazon. Um, you can access any Every, more and more businesses, because of the, the way this is going, they are building their businesses on what they call microservices, where you can just consume a small little piece of it. And this is causing entire businesses to be built around it. And it's all done through JavaScript on the browser. And uh, once you get a token, they'll issue a security token, then you use that security token. That's how you validate as people move through your system. Uh, I didn't see any place in creating a website where we were able to put in metadata. How do, uh, how do you approach uh, search engine op optimization here? So, just like you would any website, if you're hosting it in, say, HostGator, it's just in the HTML. So pull up smartbizmojo.com or your website. Pull up your website, maybe walk it up there. And there's, it has more interesting metadata. And we'll just use source. So you put it in just like that, it, 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 just like you would any website. And when you put your index.html file into your S3 bucket, it's just part of that index.html. No, oh, this isn't coming up. I don't know how to get it onto that other screen. Does Amazon sneak anything in there, cookies? There we go. No, it's all, it's just this stuff. No. Yeah, it's just that the file you upload is what's served down to the browser. So this one, there's some metadata, some tags. Um, I did this. I put in the meta property and just so if somebody, I was showing Randy, here's your website. I did this in like 30 minutes. Show, and I put it in Slack. And it didn't show anything. I said, oh yeah, I forgot to put in the meta tags that make it show a little blurb about this site. So that's what you see. That it says Facebook open graph, Twitter card tags. So if somebody posted a link to his website on Twitter, it would have a little bit to it, not just the URL. And one of the things you can do uh, with the S3 buckets is you can specify individual like times of the file. So like all of my files don't have extensions, but they have a content type specified. Right. Because I'm very particular with my extensions. Um, so I have to explicitly specify the extension. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah. And it looks a lot better to the person. Right, but they're not folders. They're yeah. like slash, right. which is also key. That's cool. Can you bring, since you brought that up, can you bring up the smart Mojo website? Sure. I'm particularly proud of it. It's really stupid. It's more from that. I'll just bring up a new browser. Although I'm amazed you've gotten the Slack unrolled thing actually. I must be doing something wrong because Slack will never unroll my site. Uh, you just put in these property. I got them all, and it's like, no, nah, I hate you. Hmm. You could go grab those off the site, put them in yours and put it as a test. So scroll down. I had to make it cheesy in some way. Okay. There's a little bit of, okay, keep going. I have my an token animated GIF. Go up a little higher. <laughs> Here's a video tour of our it's a NES game with Jetsons. 
So you can embed. So you can put all sorts of. So is that, that's not hosted on the US? No. It's on YouTube. Uh, But this is kind of an example of a static web page that's not too static. Mm -hmm. And this is not taking, this is not doing anything other than standard HTML. Uh, and, and actually is taking use of another company's service, which is in this case YouTube. You just embedded YouTube. Uh, the same thing with the login screens. That's kind of the same thing you're doing when you're using a login service. It'll, it, it obviously will be some text and everything, but you're embedding into them and talking directly to them instead of talking to your server. And it's the same thing going on here. We're not talking to the S3 bucket at all. Whenever you do anything in that window, you're going to YouTube and talking directly to YouTube. So you're, you're really not paying for video storage then either? No, you're, you're not, if YouTube, it's I don't know. YouTube. Yeah. The guy who posted this is paying. Will they pay for yeah, it? Just YouTube. Just YouTube. They get commercials, though you will get commercials on it. Somebody has to pay something. <laughs> I think this is Bootstrap, isn't it? Uh, no, that one's not. Yours. Okay. Mine is. Website. My my website is Bootstrap. And when I did this one, I was like, no, I don't want to use Bootstrap. I mean, you can go this ultra simple. So you don't even have to get bogged down in the so the design. It's just you can get by. If you're a designer, you do need to get bogged down in design. <laughs> but as say a tech person or doing a an author or, or all sorts of different websites or a Hobby or some organization you belong to. Yeah. Very Don't put a web page on your business card that is under construction. Just <laughs> either leave it off the business card or pay the twenty bucks a year to have a, a website on S three. Or you do it at your own risk. Or do it at your own risk. Yeah. So are there any uber cool Amazon specific services on the back end that we have access to when we use this? Like can we Alexa enable our website? Yes, what you're really, the serverless, like Alexa is a serverless um, service. Um, it will run, it's, it's, when you go serverless, Amazon's managing all the infrastructure for you. You're not having to create your own virtual cloud. Um, but you'll be doing that through like the API gateways and stuff like that. Um, and you'll be wiring it up through Lambda and kind of like how CloudFront sits at the front and it just grabs stuff off S3 buckets or wherever you tell it to get it from. Uh, the serverless kind of sets out there on the front too. You can call Lambda functions directly from CloudFront. And so it'll tell, oh yeah, go to the S3 bucket and get this file and show it. Or it can go and grab, you know, when you want to do an Alexa skill. Um, you'll probably activate it through the Alexa service and they can ask, you can have it so that when you tell it to bring up the web, it could actually, you know, do something off your, we could hit, your service, you can have APIs there. Generally, it's a voice activation to an existing API, is how to think of it, Alexa. So you create something, I don't know, returns what temperature it is. Say you had an API you could hit and it would tell what the temperature is at your house. You can build an Alexa skill where you can ask Alexa and they'll tell you that. Of course, Alexa's in your house, so, but still. Maybe you went over this already, but um, you can get all your user data and hit count and stuff like that from when you sign in on the AWS? No, that is you're gonna to wanna to do Google Analytics for that. There will be a raw number that tells you how much data you've transferred out and you can put uh, some metrics in there for that type of stuff. Um, and there, there, there is a service for monitoring. There's Cloud uh, Watch um, and there's Cloud Trail for auditing. Uh, and you'll have to configure them. And I think you can get those all set up. Um, 
But the other thing you can do is just embed Google Analytics in here and then set up a Google Analytics account. And it's it's really is geared towards web traffic. Uh, will you make the slides available for people to download afterwards? Yes. Great. Somewhere. Second. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, with, cloud, with CloudFront, you can also invalidate your, your uh, distribution, right? Yes. In case you actually do want to make a change and your PDL is already a So for um, what you would do in that case, um, I think I'll just, well, um, when you go in there, you can edit your distribution. So you don't have to invalidate it and do a new one. You can actually edit it. So you can go in and change your TTL at that point. When you hit edit, it's going to redeploy it. And it's going to take 30, 45 minutes to deploy it. Um, but you can make any type of changes. There are a few things that are harder to change. Um, I think, I, I, I can't remember, but I think the origin, if you're changing your origin, I think you're going to have to invalidate it. When you invalidate it, you'll click the invalidation button for that distribution. That takes a while to do. So, well, it's I, I I made the mistake. What did I do? I did something where um, I changed the origin of the S3. I didn't use that. I told you how to cut the uh, copy the endpoint of the redirect origin and not use the one in the dropdown. I used the one in the dropdown, and that was giving me all kinds of funky results. And so I needed to change the origin. And that is technically a new distribution. When you change the origin, you have created a new distribution. So for that, I think I had to invalidate the distribution and create a new one. If you're changing the variables within it, like if you want to change it to be HTTP and HTTPS, or if you want to drop your SSL certificate, or if you want to change the time to live, uh, that you can do as an edit. You won't have to go through the shutdown time. Your, your existing distribution will keep going. Uh, while the new one is being deployed, but you still got to go through the deploy time for the new one to get out there and get everywhere. I know it's it's crazy though. We I complain about a thirty or forty five minute wait time to distribute something worldwide. I'm, I'm impatient now. I want it to be instant. Yeah, one of the things you can do with Skips though is you can tell it to only invalidate the files that have changed when you push the file. Uh, and so. That can be a lot simpler than just going to CloudFront and saying, Yeah, do it. Reset everything. And you can request Amazon to clear your CloudFront cache for you before the time to live. You have to pay for that. That's not free. Yeah, it's expensive. Yeah, they don't like doing it. When I'm, I'm fiddling with things, my, my bills go up. <laughs> Uh, I know that the, the certificate manager is all four days old now. They just announced it, right? Uh, how much easier is it to use that versus whatever one had to do before? And one should, I guess one should be aware that this is new and a lot of the tutorials out there are not going to necessarily reference that right away. Um, I think though they're using Amazon as the certificate authority, and, it, and so Amazon's been issuing its own certificates for a, a while. They do it for their own infrastructure. Yeah, so it wasn't that much harder than I did it last year. Yeah. It was the same number of clicks, roughly. Yeah, it's, um, do you mean using somebody else besides Amazon to get your SSLs? No, I just know that this service is new. I don't know how that really changes the flow. But I think Certificate Manager's been out there. Yeah, I've, I've okay. got my last couple of SSL certificates from them last year. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fantastic. Well, they, they redo them all the time. Yeah. And they also add all these new features all the time. Maybe they just added private, because there is that whole private authority thing that started now, and that's a different critter from and, and public. Every time I go in, because I use it so infrequently, it looks different. And so it's like, oh, how do I do this? Yeah, so next week, random screenshots might be the one of the. And if you Google, <laughs> if you get lost, just Google static website hosting. Uh, S3 static website hosting, and you'll see many of the same steps I walked you through. There'll be different articles, but the screens will look different because they may have done it a year ago or 18 months ago. I have to say, having bought SSL certificates for other sites over the years, this Randy showed me this, and it blew me away how much easier it is and quick. And 
there's no coordination with HostGator, Media Temple, whoever, uh, wherever your dream host, wherever you're going, to get it installed and it's included in the price. Yeah. Do you think of Daniel we uh, renew? That's a good question. I'm not sure what the renewal is. They, they said it wasn't an auto renewal. Oh, uh, that's. I haven't been prompted to renew my SSL certificate. Yeah. So, does it? They do expire. They do expire, but I think you can. They don't auto. I don't. I haven't seen an auto renew option on there. Uh, there was something I saw, though, for renewals that said it was non-renewable, the SSL certificate. So they probably want you to go get a, a new one. It seems awkward, though, that they would have you do that. I'll, I'll, dub, I'll check on that. That's a good question. <laughs> No, I have not. That requires a Google account. There are some really neat things Google has yeah, that I'm are better. Some aspects of it seem a lot simpler. The Amazon approach seems to require that Well, the thing is with Amazon, um, they've been doing this forever. And they get started with these kind of services that can be kind of clunky. And then they come out with a new one that's much more automated. Google services, um, I've used their Firebase, which is their database, their NoSQL database. It is much easier to get up and running, and you do everything from the browser uh, than running, uh, setting up Lambda and going to DynamoDB. In general, sweeping generalizations, Google's got the best engineering solutions out there. They're not considered as good a cloud service as AWS, but they don't have the breadth yet. They don't have everything out there. There'll be holes in what they offer. Um, and I haven't done anything as simple as this. It may be simpler up there. But then it's, you know, it's Google's got their own world, their own, what they're trying. Amazon gets paid to do this. That's what, they don't get paid advertising. They don't get paid. They're not scanning your data. They keep AWS separate. They do scan your data for anything you buy on Amazon.com because they're feeding you data through Amazon.com when you're on the site based upon your previous sales. But they don't have access into the AWS stuff and they keep it clean and simple and straight. Google does the same thing. They don't, they don't go scanning your private data. That's, that's only Gmail. That's right, that's only Gmail. Now, you can go, go somewhere in Google, I found it the other day, and download all your private data and mine was like eight gigs. Every single true. phone call I made, when I made it, number I made it to, because I have a Google number? Um, yeah. That comes from web analytics going through, because you're using services. Sort of, that's different than opening up the cloud account and storing data. Oh, I see. Hopefully it's different. I think it is. I actually do. I think if they ever got into, especially the way things are going now, if it ever gets out that they're scanning the data you store up in their cloud service, they're out of business. Their cloud service will be out of business. And sweeping generalization, when you're paying for something, then it's not so subject to monitoring. You're not paying for your Google Voice number. No. Or your Gmail and Facebook. And so then you are kind of the product. Yeah, that's some. A generous, a generous so true. But yet, some somewhere someone has to pay, and if you're not paying, somebody else is paying to get your data. That's the general rule. So anything that's free. Now I say that, but AWS has a free tier, but they do cap the free tier, and it is for one year, and there is data limits on all this stuff. So yes, you have S3 up to 50 gigabytes or something like that. I don't know. It's pretty big. Yeah, micros. Yeah. And then if you start, they have a, a relational database service where you spin up your own virtual host and you install software on them. And you can install Microsoft Server, SQL Server, and you can also install Oracle. But you've got to pay the licenses for that. Those will never be free. They do have open source databases if you want to use them. But uh, generally, the free tier. Uh, PCs, that you, EC2 instances you can spin up can't handle the big databases. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you.
now you're welcome to look around and check out what we've got if you're not familiar with the space. Ask questions about that and about the talk. You can ask Randy about the topic. If anybody has anything they would like to talk about on a Sunday talk or teach a class, um, just talk to me. We're always looking for things. So we'll have a, another one of these on, in May. We're not exactly sure of the topic. One of the topics coming up is a small home 3D printer shootout. <laughs> we're waiting for one of those. Yeah. <laughs> He's got a $100 printer coming, so we're kind of, that one's on hold. That's coming up, and that I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. See, and you can bring one of your big giant, that's, that's still a home, under $400 printer. Um, but I don't know if that'll be yeah. May or June, July, or something that's coming. So talk to me about what you'd like to talk about.